That's it. That's good. <laughs> I had a few people emailing me last minute sort of say, do I need to connect something? And hi, J.A., you got on as well. Very good. Good to yeah, know. Anita's there. Amanda's oh, there. Oh, hello, Anita. That's my sister. Um, yeah, I'm assuming she's been a regular. On. Yeah, and then my other sister might be on Patricia as well. Are you there, Trish? <laughs> it's like a family Is thing. it like a family business going on? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So okay. we've got about 12 people, so we might as well start, hey? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, uh, i just like to welcome you all um, this evening and thank you. If it's your first time, uh, welcome. And if you're back for more, well, we're glad we didn't scare you off, which is a good thing. Um, we've also got Dr. Arun Diaz, you know, as a co-host, but we've also got Fenella who will be telling um, her story to us later on. Um, and I won't go into a lot of detail about that because I'd really like for her to be able to share her journey. But she is a um, bariatric patient who's had surgery not that long ago and it has done extremely well. So we can't wait to hear what tools she's put in place um, to help her on her journey. Um, and Dr. Arundh, he's really here for good looks. I said to him, he's the thorn between the roses. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've, I took offense to that, actually. Uh, guys, those of you who are hearing on the line, when we were prepping for this a uh, couple of days ago, and I was giving my suggestions and feedback to, you know, how we can make it really valuable. Uh, the comment that I had to hear from these two beautiful ladies, and they're both teachers, by the way, is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like a thorn between the two roses, you know. Say, okay, I'll try not to take that personally now. <laughs> well, Dr. Arun, we are roses now, thanks to your work. So, <laughs> exactly. Thanks. Isn't that right, Fenella? Beautiful growing roses now. Beautiful. Exactly. Growing right. in the opposite direction. Well, I, I say that, you know, the roses can only be looking beautiful if they have a stem to support them, you know? Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> And okay, we're talking good. about the STEM tonight. We are. We're talking about the tools that we've put in place to help us achieve wellness. Um, not just weight loss, but just wellness, uh, mind, body and soul. So um, basically, we want this to be interactive as per usual. So if you've got some questions, by all means, Dr. Run's got not much to do. Tonight. He's doing a little bit of a presentation. So he can maybe look at the uh, questions and, and let us know what's happening yes, there. I'm happy to yeah. do that. You have it? <laughs> I've got the shortest presentation that I have made for this one. Okay. So, Fant, are you recording by any chance? Yes, that was your it's on. Just checking. I'm paying attention. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we'll get started. So last week we talked about busting the dietary myths and we had fantastic dietitians on to discuss that with us. And I think that was really, really helpful. Um, and tonight we're looking at, okay, besides the diet side of things, what tools have we put in place to keep us on the right track with our overall wellness? Last week, I shared a slide with you, well, I shared a story that got to the point where basically, I'll just put it on now, um, this is how I left it, which was how I ended up, um, which wasn't exactly the most pleasant slide to leave it on. Um, I'm just going to present, hopefully you can see this. Um, so that's where I ended up basically with the chronic pain, the fatigue, clearly the weight gain and struggling with my mental health. Um, you know, I was struggling to find purpose and I'd tried everything. I was a little bit lost, to be honest. Um, this week, I'd like to share with you how I've turned that around. And that was May 2019. And now it's 12 months later. And, you know, I'm happy to say that um, I've, I'm out now at 79 kilos, but we're not talking so much about the scales as how I'm feeling. Is that um, in the can I ask? Sorry? Who's that in the center? It's like <laughs> Donna Ross to me. <laughs> it's me, okay? All you need is an electric guitar around your neck. Well, I am a musician after all. My daughter said, put that one on, mummy. I thought, okay, Mia. So I trust my daughter's opinion. <laughs> um, so basically, um, how did I get here in 12 months? Well, I'd obviously had bariatric surgery, but that wasn't everything. Um, and on its own, probably could only do so much. Um, so I learned in the last few years from being so chronically unwell, how important the connection is between the mind, the body and the soul and having in place practices that really look after those three areas. 
I'm still a work in progress. I, I'm not professing to have everything under control, but I certainly know that when I use these tools, I've got a better chance of maintaining good health for the long term. And that's what we want to work on um, tonight, talking about long-term goals. Um, because after the, the bariatric surgery bit does its job, then we need to maintain that and we can't maintain it if we're still, um, you know, dealing with our, our traumas, our emotional eating and all that sort of stuff. So how do we keep well? Um, so let's look at the three areas. The first thing is nurturing the mind. Um, and this is how I nurture my mind. Um, mindfulness practices. So I check in on how I'm going mentally. And if I notice that, um, you know, my energy levels are starting to drop, I'm fatigued and stuff like that, I'll do some things like jigsaw puzzles or colouring in. It's something as simple as that. I'll go to my music. I'm a music teacher by trade. I'll listen to music. I'll play music. I'll teach my kids music. Anything to get me in the moment aware and focused. Um, which takes my mind away from anything else that could be going on. Uh, meditation. Meditation is huge for me. I do it every evening and I've got my kids involved in that. They, you know, sometimes they protest, but, you know, I know it's working and it's helpful. Um, on Sundays, I do a uh, meditation with Dr. Arundir. He, he does, um, he runs this uh, program called Radical Wellness and it's yoga, it's, it's meditation um, and there's some informative uh, information as well. And we're looking at the heart this Sunday, but I definitely do meditation and find that it just calms everything down and then I can focus and get on with my day. In between that, I use the meditation apps. Uh, I've got some a screenshot there of some of them that I, I use. Um, and I've also made sure that I read and I keep my brain learning new things, you know, and I think that's important. Obviously, for my mind, I've been doing some reading on, you know, people that have overcome mental health challenges, um, ways to to deal with anxiety, natural ways to, and, and also there, if you have a look, there's, there's a book on um, drugs, you know, uh, psych, psychiatric drugs and the impact that they have and, you know, how they can help, but what, what to look out for as well in that. Um, and I've studied um, ACT therapy. Um, I've done a CBT, Mind Over Mood programs. Um, and I think that um, those, those areas have helped me immensely just to, Think about how I'm thinking and understand that awareness is the job done just about. Being aware that that's where you're at and then being kind to yourself and maybe making better decisions and being more compassionate with yourself that that's where you're at. Um, so I've found doing those particular courses life-changing. Um, so for me, that's basically what I've done to nurture my mind. There's also journaling there. I won't go into a lot of detail about that. But for me, writing down how I'm feeling um, is, is very helpful as well, um, just to get it down, because then you get it out of your head also. Danny, um, and then, yeah. there, sorry, interrupting. If you were to pick just one exercise out of all of this, just one, what would be your most powerful tool that you feel now looking retrospectively has made a huge difference? Meditation, without doubt. Great. Without doubt. Yeah. I thought um, you would say calmed, that. Yeah, it's, is that, is that okay? it's calmed my mind and it's just given my, my brain um, space, you know, space between thoughts. It's hard to explain, but it's so beneficial. I'd say meditation is like reconnecting with your source. We yeah. are looking at a source outside of us. But when we look at reconnecting it with the source, which is inside of us, it actually suddenly starts to open new opportunities, new understandings. Absolutely. So and uh, also just with that journaling, gratitude. You know, I think that that's important too, to talk about the things or to write about the things you're grateful for um, because we can get bogged down with all the things not going right in our lives. And sometimes we need to force ourselves to actually find something we're grateful for, but there's always something. And I think that that's, 
really helpful. Um, and that just changes your mindset. It just does. If you keep doing it, you know, repetitively. All right, I'll move on because I can talk. There's something very much. hilarious that I want to add on that oh, about yeah. gratitude. Someone yeah. said that, uh, you know, you come across one of the nastiest persons that you have kind of intensely disliked. Mm. What do you think you can say that they are like, you know, they, they could be grateful for? And yeah. I think one of my mentors, he said, in those situations, what you think of is whatever they are exhaling is useful for the trees. So <laughs> well, that's that's kind of right. a, you know, a funny way of looking at it that you can find appreciation in almost anything. That's Absolutely. And, and I think, as you've also said, that people come into your life for a reason. It could be to teach us something as well or whatever. So there's always some learning and something mm. to be grateful mm -hmm. for. And I forgot to mention there with that little video there, that was just basically trying new things. Getting out there during the 12 months after surgery, you know, it, you've got to learn that food all of a sudden isn't your best friend and what do I do instead? And I found that having fun with the kids, we went to the Sky, uh, the Rika Sky Tower. Um, we went on the Melbourne Eye. We went and had a, a weekend at the, I think it was the Hilton or the Hyatt, you know, just activities just to do something different. And, um, and that was great for my self-worth as well. Um, tools to help nurture my body. Excuse my daughter again said, Mommy, put yourself there dancing. Well, the reality is dancing is fantastic. It incorporates music, movement, you know, and I was just being silly and having a bit of fun with the kids there. But look, the first thing that helped my body was clearly the surgical tool. Um, because I wouldn't be able to dance like that 12 months ago. There's just no way I could move like that. Um, and some days I can't move like that. <laughs> but generally, um, I'm, I'm able to move my body more because of that tool. It reset me, um, you know, and oh, 60 kilos less makes a big difference. I try and eat nutritious foods. And I say, try, I'm human, and I don't torture myself if I indulge at times. But whole foods, I actually crave that a bit more now as well. It's like my body sort of is talking to me and saying, don't put that crap in your mouth because I feel it. I feel like I'm not, I'm not doing something good for my body. And it's interesting that that reset with, you know, even your, um, I don't know if oh, Fenella will talk about this a bit later, but just the foods that you actually want after surgery change, your, your taste buds change. Um, and, and so it helps you to want healthy food and you start to notice heavy foods a lot more. Obviously keeping hydrated, gut health, that's a big one. Um, those are the, they're the books that I lived on, um, especially the anti-inflammatory one as well, um, just to help me get my pain down naturally using food as as a resource. Um, obviously, Dr. Arun's book, uh, when I saw that, I just thought, wow, great, awesome. You know, this is going to keep me on track for 12 months as well after the surgery, you know. Um, but also, we talk about gut as in gut intuition as well. And I think that's sometimes the hardest yeah. thing to to allow into your life, you know, listening to your gut. Um, I think often we just do what we're supposed to do, or we think we should be doing, and we ignore what our gut is telling us. And, and then you're not living a real authentic life that you're meant to be living. So I think listening to your gut, as hard as that might be, and making decisions that perhaps aren't as popular as other people might think they are, uh, is, is crucial, I think, also. Um, Let me just ask the question to the audience, how many of them believe that, you know, gut health is the center or it's the epicenter where all the changes start? You know, this is just a, uh, you know, how just a show of hands would be really nice. You know, how many believe that this is where we need to focus on rather than how many calories and all of that because that's what diets are promoting that cut out all carbs carbs people talk about carbs oh my god you know yeah. so also, absolutely. also we've absolutely. got some really good responses over yeah, here from uh, people so thank you and, and also with the gut health i know when my gut health is off you know i get ibs type symptoms um and i know oh, okay i've been indulging too much my stress levels must be up and so forth, you know, and you get that foggy head as well, where there's no clarity. So gut health is a big one. And just having fun with the children. Um, and I don't exercise 
um, extensively because I need to be careful not to flare up my condition. However, in saying that, I find that yoga and strengthening exercises and just getting outdoors with the kids is enough and dancing, as you saw. Um, so, and how do I nurture my soul? Well, this one here is pretty clear. Be around people that bring you joy. Um, my That's kids. a huge burst of oxytocin that you're getting with all those kisses, you know? Yes, I, yes, absolutely. It's scientifically proven. Every time you get a hug, your oxytocin yeah. level goes up. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we underestimate the power of touch, human touch. And I know with this isolation we've been going through, it's made it difficult. But luckily, I've got the children in the house with me and there's an abundance of hugging and, and things like that. Um, nature. I actually created my own garden and my family would be shocked by that because I'm not a green thumb. But there you go. There's the product, uh, that flower, which is beautiful. And sometimes I just, yeah, I, know. I go outside and I have a bit of a look and, you know, just enjoy the intricacies of it, to be honest. It's just so perfect in so many ways. And, you know, just being aware of that and mindful of those things, catching up with my friends. I've got some wonderful friends um, that, you know, bring joy to my life. My family, there's a picture of my family down there um, who also bring me a lot of joy and support. Clearly they're online tonight. Um, what I also do is I've got a little blackboard that is where the staircase is. And as the children go up and down the staircase, and I do as well, I write little comments. This one here is, we can do this, I love you. And that was more to do with homeschooling. <laughs> because I thought we might have a breakdown during it. But, you know, we can do this. And it's given us the strength to push through, even though some days we just want to say, oh, goodness, no, no way. Um, so little motivational things like that. Obviously, positive affirmation books um, as well. And I've brought the outdoors indoors with, um, you know, paintings of the sea and the ocean and nature. So they're just little things. Those that prints I've look beautiful. I love them. I absolutely love them. I, I look at them all the time and I put them in a place where they can be seen. Um, so that's what I'm sort of doing. Uh, and also purpose. And I found, I feel I've found my purpose. I'm currently working with Dr. Arun and I'm helping others, other patients that are, are going through what I've just been through. And that gives me a sense of purpose, um, which is critical. I think a lot of people lose their mental health. They lose, once they lose their sense of who they are and what they're here on this earth for, that's when other health issues can come into play. And, um, you know, and we, sometimes we don't know what we're here for, um, but being open to it and being aware of what the gut is telling you, you know, it, it will lead you in the right direction. And Lisa's, sometimes- Lisa is yeah. saying you're an inspiration, Danny. Oh, thank I'd you. I'd agree with her. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I'm sure we're, we're, see, we're all inspirations in different ways. And that's what it's about, you know, finding what you've got to give and giving it. Um, I think Helen's re raising her hand as well. I'm not sure if she has a question or not. Don't worry, I'll, I'll address that. And basically, the, the last part about this is that I limit time with people or, or things that I find are not life giving. And, you know, there are things we need to do. We can't get out of, not all of us can hire a cook and not looking at anybody in particular. <clears throat> <laughs> Some of us have, have to cook. I just had a joking episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how's your cook going? Um, <laughs> but... Um, you know, and, and some of these things we, we need to do and, and that's fine. But, um, you know, even trying to find something positive about the experiences that perhaps we wouldn't necessarily enjoy, but also prioritising what gives us joy. That is, we've only got one life. We really do. And so um, limit your time with toxicity. I, I can't say that enough. It, it's not worth it. Life is precious. Um, so that's my bit on that. And just to um, finish up here, again, this thing about self-care, uh, it's not selfish to be, uh, to look after yourself. It's selfless because it's only in being able to look after yourself are you able to be uh, there for others and show them love and be there for them to support them. Um, so these, these tools are not me being selfish. They're me making me the best version of myself so I can be a great mum, hopefully friend, hopefully colleague and so forth. Um, and one of my favourite sayings that I think that I lived with 
uh, during that time was fear having two meanings. Um, you know, can make you forget everything and, and run. It, it's a powerful emotion. Or you can use it to face everything and rise. And in facing everything and rising is when you overcome it. And it actually works in a positive way. And having bariatric surgery took a lot of courage. It's not an easy way out that people often say. You are taking away your tool of comfort eating to cope with the, tra the, the trauma or the, the drama in your life and all the other things that's going on, whether it be pain or anguish, and, and replacing that with basically accountability and, and being prepared to face your demons in a way. So it takes courage, um, but I don't regret it once because it's just, it's now catapulted me into being brave about other things such as doing, doing this as well. And just looking at, you know, what I've been through, do I look at it and go, oh, poor me? No, I look at it as I'm glad for the experience um, because the rarest thing there, the flower that blooms in adversity is the rarest and the most beautiful of all. And I think it's through adversity that we become, you know, beautiful flowers, if you like. Um, and, roses, and so, roses, to be roses. precise. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. See, like we were saying, and um, and they're just uh, that's a photo of my children because they they are my purpose, and um, and that photo actually represents them being scared to go in climb trees, and I sort of said, no, we're going to do it. Let's do it. It's good for us. You're touching nature. It's good. Let's do it. And they they conquered that, and there they are smiling and happy. Um, so that's that photo there. So um, basically. That's, that's how I use my tools. Do I do it all, all the time? No, but I've got a collection there. That's not an extensive list, but it's a pretty thorough list. I'll stop sharing that now um, so we can... And I think, I think what you've said is so pertinent that it all starts with self-care. I think, uh, as they say, you know, if a cup is empty, you've got nothing to give to anyone. And that is so crucial. Self-care is not being selfish. Uh, I'm sure the audience would agree with this. Just a show of hands, just so we know that, you know, we are all in sync about this because it's crucial to understand that you have to take out time for yourself yeah. uh, to be the best version of yourself. So uh, awesome. I think, Danny, that was really moving and seeing that journey that you've gone through uh, and I think what you have now turned yourself into is with that wealth of experience that you've got, you know, how, when you are, as they say, you know, in, the, in a wave, there is a sine wave, you know, so there is a peak and then there is a valley. After a valley, there is a peak, but you have experienced that valley, the, as they say, the, the dark night of the soul. And yeah. that's, that's crucial. So it's enriched you and you can go out and help other people. So that's really beautiful. Oh, my pleasure, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't know she was going to be on. That's a girlfriend of mine. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is stop talking because <laughs> I'd like to do that. I'd like to pass on to um, Dr. Arun. He's going to talk about the, the science behind why some of these tools actually work. And, um, you know, this is not just me talking. This The scientific evidence behind why having a collection of tools in your toolbox actually helps. So over to you, Dr. Ron. I can take care of the questions at this stage too. No worries. So uh, guys, my presentation really has got five slides, but don't underestimate me. I can still talk for two hours, so, uh, but I'll not do that. <laughs> don't worry. I can uh, talk for a very long time, but I guess the bottom line, what I'm trying to say is I'm just going to delve on this one tool that I use personally in my own life. And I want to share this with you, which is a, uh, pen and paper journal. It's not a digital journal because somehow what I have found is that a digital journal hasn't got that impact. Now, um, someone's disabled my sharing. So sorry, I need to um, upgrade myself to, where am I? Um, just one second. I need to uh, Danny, you are the host. You got to switch it back to me now. Sorry. Okay. Um, and yeah. I actually haven't got screen sharing on at the moment. So no, no, no. Uh, if you go into your, uh, you know, section of, um, yep. sorry, hang on a minute. Look now. And you, you make me the uh, host. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Got it. Got it. Yep. Okay. 
Good. Learning all this. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. I can see uh, that I'm able to share now. So basically what Danny's journey has shown us is from information to transformation. And what I mean by that really is that when you get true profound information, which has emotion, which has story attached to it, that information starts to create a shift in your awareness. You start to see possibility. You start to see an opportunity here to become unstuck. Friends, we got to understand no matter what the challenge is, your challenges might be different to my challenges, which might be different to someone else's challenges. Mm -hmm. We all are going to be faced with challenges some or the other time in our lives. And the beauty is going to be if we take this information and apply it, and it doesn't matter whether it's a weight issue, whether it's a health issue, it's a relationship issue, it is all about elevating our awareness. If you're able to elevate your awareness from being a victim to a victor, victim means you're looking for someone to blame. Okay, this is the reason why this happened to me, my spouse or my this person or my boss or whoever it may be, you know, versus I want to take responsibility and I want to do something about it as is reflected by Danny's story. And I'm sure we are going to hear the same theme in Fenella's story with a different twist, of course, you know. So true information leads to transformation. I don't need to introduce myself. Hopefully everyone knows me by now. But uh, I think the book, when I wrote the book, Happy Gut, Healthy Weight, the research that went into it completely blew me away because I found so much information about the gut weight connection and the gut brain connection. I was wondering to myself, why doesn't everybody know about it? Like this is solid science. It's not like my opinion or someone else's opinion, you know, because we know that whenever we do surgery on the gut, the gut and the brain communicate through the gut brain axis. It not only shifts the hormonal interaction between the gut and the brain. And as Danny was saying that, and I'm sure Fenella, you would have experienced the same after sleeve surgery, your taste preferences change. You are craving whole foods. You are craving salads. And I hear this every time, not once or twice, every time. And the reason for that is the hormones that your gut is sending, the signals that your gut is sending to your brain has altered. The bacteria that reside in your gut that talk to your gut and to the hormones, uh, through the hormones to your mind has changed. The composition has altered. And that is the basis of this information. However, what is crucial to understand is that if that new neuronal pathway, this pathway of looking at the brain network, that's what I want to say is how your brain is now getting rewired with these changes in your hormones. If you do not re reinforce it with some exercise that causes it to basically understand that this is now going to be my default mode. Yeah. Previously, the default mode was, hey, I'm hungry, let's, uh, or I'm stressed out, let's go to the fridge, take out the chocolate ice cream, uh, or that makes me feel very comfortable now. Now I feel comfortable. So, you know, that mode or that state is changing. And what I show you here in this slide, which is a summary slide of everything that I talk about is that in that in your brain, you have a conscious mind and then you have a subconscious mind. But in between the two, there is this analytical mind. The analytical mind is like a sieve. It's like a filter. No matter how much information you get about stress management, water intake, diet, all those good things that we need to know, your analytical mind is like a filter. If you are in states of what is mentioned in the red box, like fear, doubt, worry, indecisions, or toxic stress, well, that analytical mind is like a gateway. It is going to close and no information will go to your subconscious mind, which is where your habits live. If you are not using any of this information to translate into action, which means changing your habits, well, it's just going to bounce off. It's a, it's a time that you've spent, you felt good about it, and thank you. Nothing changed. 
Nothing's changed because your actions have not changed ultimately. Whereas when your analytical mind opens, and as Danny said, through meditation, the exercise that I'm talking about is journaling, which is also a very powerful tool, visioning, developing intuition, affirmation, quiet time, or even green space time. And what I mean by that is gardening, spending time in nature. Once again, something that Danny alluded to is a very powerful tool in allowing your analytical mind to open up and understanding, again, creating that awareness that what is it that matters? And that is what starts to cause the shift. Friends, journaling and neuroplasticity. Now that term neuroplasticity really means one thing, that neuro and plastic, which means that neuro is related to brain, Plastic is that it can be molded. So we have been brought up thinking that after four or five years, brain development stops. Nothing happens. No, nothing. And that is now proven to be incorrect. You can set up new brain networks. If a person starts to learn music or a new language at the age of 80, well, they are setting up new neuronal circuits. It is proven scientifically now. It's not an opinion anymore. So journaling allows you to start creating new brain networks, starts you to think differently. And as they say, think outside the box, because until now we have been taught to think within the box, fit in. That's the culture, just fit in culture. You are not asked to imagine something, you know, and, and that's just, to, just to interrupt you there, because I know you like interrupting. <laughs> Sure, um, please. Uh, Rebecca said um, it builds the positivity muscle, you know, that your brain is, is a muscle in some ways, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, journaling and all that builds that muscle. I think that's spot on, uh, Rebecca. So. Absolutely. It is like a mental muscle. And that's what I say. Mental muscle is something that we don't work on. We go to the gym to build our physical muscles, but we don't work on the mental muscle. Benefits of journaling. Well, number one, it gives you clarity. This is my second last slide, I think. Uh, it gives you clarity of thoughts, which is very important because a lot of us are confused. We are overwhelmed with information. We just don't know what is it that is going to work and what should be prioritized. Second, very importantly, it gives you a record of your progress. How are you doing? Six weeks ago, Six months ago, if you've been journaling for that period of time, you have a written record of how you were feeling on that day. I still look back on my journals from years ago. I've been journaling now religiously since 2016. I was looking at my journals from 2016. They are my prized possessions. One day I'll hand them over to my kids who can kind of, you know, take the legacy on, you know, this is what our dad used to do. Look how he used to waste his time. <laughs> I'll love that. I'll love reading that. I'm sure you won't say that. <laughs> but, but I guess the point is, it is so satisfying to see your own growth. See, one of my mentors said, you do not have to compare yourself to others. You just have to be a better version of how you were yesterday. Just become a better version of yourself. When we compare ourselves with others, we actually put ourselves down, which is not good for our self-esteem. So that is, uh, you know, uh, the second thing. The third thing is it allows us to see the bigger picture when there is chaos all around. See, during stressful times, we are only thinking, we get very narrow focused. Our focus becomes narrow on environment, on our body and time. That's what we start to focus on. That's a stress response. We mm -hmm. don't see the bigger picture. It allows us to de-stress as we have already said that it, several times in my own life, I have experienced that when I was confused, I was stressed, I just didn't know there was too much happening. I just went to my park, which I'm fortunate to live close to. I would just sit on a bench and I would just write on an A4 journal. That's it, just pencil my thoughts. And it was really, really profound. And lastly, it helps me to prioritize. It allows me to focus on what really matters and cut off the things which don't matter. So I guess what I just wanted to say is that for our weight loss surgery patients, we have a customized journal 
two weight loss surgery clients, which is available from Center for Weight Loss, my website. Danny has used that. I'm sure, Fenella, you had that too as yeah. well. And we would really be keen to hear your sort of, you know, experiences from that. And look, that is really pretty much all that I had to say in terms of, I just would like to know from the audience, is anyone uh, doing any form of journaling? I'd be really keen to know just from a, uh, you know, and any experience they might want to type in just so that we can Absolutely. read it. Just, uh, we've got some great comments here about journaling. Um, Lizette said, to, I've been, oh, I've just lost that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it sorry. just went. That's okay. No, I, all good. I'll get it back up. Um, oh, chat, here it is. Sorry about that. Um, okay, it's gone again. My chat box has gone. Um, I can read it. Lizette said, I've oh, there been... it is. I've got it now. Yeah. yeah. So I've been writing since I was five. I still have all my books and I love reading. I really should start writing again. So, you know, there you go. That's Absolutely. fantastic. Um, and also someone else was talking about also writing somewhere along. The Kylie line. has asked, can I just say, Kylie has asked, what do you write about? Ah, can you yeah. answer that, Danny? What do you write about? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think what I write about is just the, you know, when you get a thought and you get an emotion that's automatic and, and it starts to infiltrate how you behave and what's going on around you and you can't see beyond that because you're stuck. I write about that. So I actually write down what thought has triggered what emotion and look at how rational that is or how can I now move on from that? You know, I think when you write it down on paper, it starts to look different. When it's in your head, it can just ruminate, it can change, it can become a That's monster. Right. It, it you know, you and for, yeah, for me, it gives clarity and it also puts it somewhere so I can move on, you know? Um, Awesome. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's been, um, thank you for that presentation, um, Arun. I think that was awesome. But I'm really looking forward to hearing from our special guest exactly. this evening, Fenella. Um, like we just mentioned before, Fenella's a teacher. So, um, and uh, and she, she was struggling a little bit with her weight and she'll talk more about oh. that. And she's had surgery not that long ago, but she's doing remarkably well, honestly. And um, I'd like to pass it over to you, Fenella, to talk about the tools that you've been implementing in your journey. Lovely. Thank you, Danny. And thank you, Arun. I really enjoyed both of your presentations so far. Yeah. Um, so about me. Um, I, as, I, as I said, it's my weight loss story so far. You know, I'm I'm not I'm nowhere near done yet, and I'm I'm far from perfect. But when I went into this, I decided I was going to go 100%, and and I've tried to put in as many things as I can in place as early as I can, so that I can really make some lasting changes. So where was I not that long ago? Uh, I so my heaviest weight is 165.5 kilos. Uh, which is a BMI of 52.2. So obviously that's quite a high weight and BMI. Um, so some of the struggles in my just day-to-day -day life, which I'm sure some of you have experienced is, you know, I, I try and go for a walk. So I live in Bright, which is a beautiful area in Victoria. It's amazing. And I would try and get outside and walk and my back would hurt. I could barely walk probably a kilometre without it starting to hurt. I, I would I'd have to walk around at work. So while I'm a teacher, I, I teach hospitality and event management. And I would uh, be trying to be on my feet all day doing a service period and have to keep sneaking off to the office to sit down. And it made life really, really difficult. I hated everything in my wardrobe because, you know, and not because my clothes were rubbish, but because, you know, I didn't like the way I looked in any of them. Mm. I would see my own reflection in a, in a window. Uh, I remember even seeing it in the side of an escalator at a shopping centre and just feeling like rubbish. I just felt like, oh my gosh, what have I been doing? So I'm meant to be out and having a good time with my friends and instead I'm looking at my reflection and feeling horrible. I was always aware of the fact that I felt like the biggest person in a room. So I was constantly judging myself against everybody else. And that would be whether it was a work meeting, a catch up with my family, all the time I just had this feeling that I was the biggest person in the room. And it would just crush me. It was absolutely crushing. So mentally, I wasn't in a good place. And physically, uh, I, had, I was diagnosed with hypertension at 29 years old, which obviously no one wants to hear. And so obviously then had to go on to blood pressure medication. 
Um, and I was really concerned about the fact that I hadn't yet started a family and I actually got married only last year and uh, really concerned about whether I would be able to safely and healthily have children. Um, so I had, I was not in a good place, but part of my journey was I had to look at how I got where I did because if I don't understand that, then I don't know where to go moving forward. So I'd struggled with my weight for quite a long time. So since I was a, probably late teens and food became a coping mechanism. Um, and as I put on more and more weight and probably put pressure on myself in other aspects of my life too, I developed a very negative inner voice. So an inner voice that constantly told me I was not good enough, that I was a failure, that no matter what I did, I wasn't going to succeed. And this voice affected me in every aspect of my life, but with food as my coping mechanism, every time I'd be feeling bad about something, I went to food. And, you know, then I also used food as a reward. So food was a good thing and food was a bad thing. And it just was, it was what I went to. It was my go-to. And Bella, voice, sorry to interrupt yeah. you there, but I think that's very common. Yeah, um, absolutely. Have a, you know, even a show of hands of how many people uh, listening this evening have done that, um, you know, use food as a coping mechanism to suppress emotions and yeah. also as a reward, you know. Um, yeah. Well, you know, something great's happened. Let's celebrate with food. Yeah. Thank you to those participants. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I think that's quite common. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, and this voice, this voice would get louder and louder and louder. And I, I probably wasn't as aware of this voice then as I am now. Um, so it probably had a lot more control over me than I would, I'd like to admit, really. But it did. It, it took control over me. And then I tried all the diets. I did a lot of diets between the ages of, of you know, 18 and, and 28, where I, I did Weight Watchers and I, you know, I did... Uh, 12 week body transformation. I spoke to a dietitian. I got doctor's advice. I exercised hard and I did lots and lots of things. And I'd always do well for a while. Yeah. I mean, I lost over 20 kilos doing Weight Watchers, but I'd always then something had happened, whether it was my weight would stall or I'd have a tough time at work or something had happened. And I essentially give up. And looking back, what I can see that was is that I was terrified of failure and this inner voice that's telling me i'm gonna fail the moment it found an excuse to run away it did so i basically fell into the trap of if you never try then you don't have to fail you just you know give up and that's what causes people to stay stuck isn't it yeah, absolutely yeah i just kind of felt like i had nowhere else to go and i got to a place where i honestly started to believe that I would never be able to turn my weight around. I was there. I, I thought there was no more diet that could help me, no program, nothing. I honestly believe that. And it was, a, I can think back now and think that, you know, I was preparing myself to be 160 kilos plus for the rest of my life. And I hated it, but I didn't think I had a choice. It's like you, did, you don't have the control, isn't it, for now? It's like yeah. the control's being taken. No, no, just a question you. there. Uh, yes. uh, what shifted for you to consider surgery, which is drastic for someone who's 26, 27 years old, you know? Well, one of my friends actually had weight loss surgery. Right. Um, so it was the husband of one of my best friends. Uh, and he actually had surgery with Arun. Um, and I, he, he and I had shared a lot of experiences together and we'd talked about our weight together for years. You know, we'd talked about the diets we'd tried and, you know, he'd be trying something, then I'd try something. We'd always kind of shared this as the thing we had that we'd talk about it. And then I saw him, he came up to visit me and I just went, what on earth have you done in your life? Because let me know your secret. And he was like, well, I haven't told a lot of people, but I've had weight loss surgery. I had gastric sleeve surgery. And I kind of went, okay, well, maybe I need to do some research. I like researching things. I don't like to just jump in with no knowledge. So I did. Did he not give you my business card? Uh, he did it, but I did, I did get, uh, I did say, no, I did say who is your surgeon because I, I trust my best friend very much. She's also a researcher. And she, she said to me, she said that they'd been to a few surgeons and you were the one that she felt she connected to in the fact that it wasn't just about, you know, performing the surgery and walking away. It was about creating a better lifestyle afterwards. So That's that was something right. that really resonated for me. So I, you know, I had my appointment. We went with gastric sleeve surgery for me. 
um, especially considering that I haven't had children yet. Uh, and obviously the risk then for children is, is lower. Uh, so I knew that with a sleeve being my weight, uh, if I wanted to get down to anywhere near where I'd like to be, it was going to take a lot of effort on my behalf. I wasn't going to be able to just go in, have surgery, walk out and just live my life as I have been. I was going to have to make some big changes. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the misconception, isn't it, Fenella? That yes. people think, oh, you've taken the easy way out. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Definitely I, not. I, and look, anybody who is game enough to tell me that they think it's an easy way out gets a little education session afterwards. <laughs> if they about do. The things that I have done in my life <laughs> to make this change. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I just add one thing to that? Is that yes, people can absolutely do it on their own with diet and exercise and committed. It might just take them 10 years, you know. Yeah. So if you want to fast track your results, yeah. you need a tool, a more powerful tool. Yeah, absolutely. And that and that gives you the, you know, just yeah, exactly it catapults you think, oh, look, this is working. Something's yes. actually working. And then the positive mindset starts to, but we still need to put into these, these yes. practices in. So we'll talk a bit more about the tools that you've been using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and I had gastric sleeve surgery on the 17th of January this year. So, you know, there's my beautiful shot. It was, you know, uh, uh, you know, if those who have been through it, you know, surgery is not easy. It's not an easy decision to make either. Um, but right now, sitting back, it's one of the best decisions I have ever made in my life, honestly. So there's a bit of a comparison photo, uh, even wearing the same dress. And this was uh, actually a few kilos ago, probably about seven kilos ago. Um, so my current weight now is 118.5, which means my BMI is down to 37.2, which the other thing is that I'm now no longer in uh, class three obese which I was very far into, which for me was actually a very exciting moment when I, when I dropped down to moderate risk from high risk because it felt like I was really getting somewhere. So obviously in a very short time, I've, I've been able to make a massive difference. Uh, and I think part of that reason is is because I've tried to set myself up to succeed rather than fail. So what I'm going to touch on tonight is what I'm calling my six pillars which are my six main things that I use to keep me supported, especially when I am struggling or going through the tougher days, because yeah. not every day is easy. No. There are some days that seem to be an absolute breeze and others that it's a struggle all day. So the first one of those is support. So for me, support that I get is from people like my husband, my parents, my in-laws, friends, colleagues, in, I've told people, I'm not ashamed to tell people about the fact that I've had weight loss surgery. I'm proud of the fact that I made a decision to do something about my health. What that decision is, is nobody else's business but mine. And so I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not embarrassed by it. And I'm very happy to talk about my story, what I'm going through and share it. And from my experience, it allows people to be there for you if you're prepared to share with them. So it makes me realize a lot of things like one, I'm not going through this alone. Even if I'm trying to lose, you know, 80 kilos, there's a lady at work who's just trying to lose those last five, but we can still chat to each other and support each other about what we're doing at the moment to work together. It doesn't matter that we're trying to lose a completely different amount of weight. Um, I'm not the only one who struggles and reminding myself of that by talking to other people is really important. I'm not the only person who has tough days you know, and that's good. People can support you with that. My husband has, I've been very lucky. I mean, I'm, I'm that's why I married him. Uh, but he has been really supportive. And we talked about this before my surgery, because I said, if we, if we don't do this together, it's not going to work. You know, we live together, we eat together. You know, if, if we're not on, in this together, it's not going to work. And now he, he's lucky. I mean, he's, you know, very active, great metabolism, you know, sits in a healthy BMI. <laughs> and you know, can eat pretty much whatever he wants and, and doesn't really put on weight. But just out of curiosity, Fenella, has he lost some weight as well? He has. So, oh, okay. so I, I call that's the ripple effect. Yeah. It only goes so, one way, you know, it goes from women to men, not the other yep. way around. <laughs> <laughs> this is my personal research yeah. telling me. Oh, so really? it's even stuff like he, he snacks, he would buy at the supermarket, which in the past in a diet he might have gone out and still had and just I would have not eaten anything. He's like, no, nah, 
if you're not having them, I'm not having them. Uh, oh, that's so, so nice. you know, we eat together that, and he's on my nice. side and it's really nice to have someone who is just on, on your side. Like yeah. it's great. Cause you know, we go out walking together and his mother, like my mother-in-law comes as well. And we, we've been going for walks around town, which has been great. And I've dragged my family into doing the push up challenge this May for raising money for Headspace as well. Uh, so I've dragged in my husband, uh, my brother-in-law and his girlfriend and two of our friends uh, to make up our team. So today we had to do 30 push-ups each to get towards our goal. Uh, and I mean, mine not be as great as uh, some of their push-ups, but I get through it and that's what matters. Absolutely. So, well you know, and I can see Lizette saying that, you know, your boss saying that they're really proud, that they're really proud of you. And I, I 100% my workplace, my colleagues are absolutely fantastic. They have been excited for me since the day that I signed the paperwork saying I was having surgery. Uh, and I'm, I'm really lucky. So my boss, my colleagues, you know, are great teachers, obviously, that I work with. And they're, they're fantastic. So, yeah, support has been really, really important. You can't, I, I, I couldn't do this without the support of other people. Because when you're feeling like you're struggling, you know those people are there for you. You're yeah. not by yourself. You are not alone. So, number two is exercise. And I've always enjoyed exercise to a certain degree. I've just, it's always been so uncomfortable, uh, especially when, you know, I weighed 165 kilos. You know, a short walk, you'd be in pain. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, it's a program that told you to jump off the ground. I'd be genuinely concerned about what was going to happen to my body when it got back onto the ground. Yeah. So that's been something that I have really, it took me a little while after surgery, but I kind of just went, all right, I've got to start getting active because I'm still getting puffed out. My weight's not going to change that. I've got to get active because I want to do stuff. I want to live my life. I want to get out there and do fun stuff. And a lot of stuff I want to do requires a basic fitness level. So I, for me at home, especially in uh, isolation, I've been doing Les Mills on demand. Um, but there's like so many programs out there you can do. But it means that I am, you know, some days I'm jumping around, dancing around the living room. Other days I'm lifting weights. You know, other days I'm just working on my core strength. But I now do exercise seven days a week. I do not miss a day. And if I'm not feeling up to do a full 55 minutes, I'll do 30. Yeah. If I don't feel like, you know, I've got as much energy, I'll go for a walk. But I hold myself accountable that I'm doing this for me and for the me that I want to be. And that means I exercise every day and I feel like I'm really like, I feel like I'm getting stronger and that's making me feel mentally stronger too. Yeah. Absolutely. Feeling like I have the ability to do stuff makes me feel strong mentally and physically. And for Nella, I think there's that what you mentioned about, you know, there's a difference between losing weight and being fit. So yes. You can lose weight and not have, you know, a BMI that's that's huge, but still yep. be very unfit. Yeah. You know, and fitness is a separate thing, really, yes. to weight loss in some way. Yep. Um, so that incorporating that exercise is important in, in whatever capacity you can. Yeah. And I make sure that at no point do I let my brain think that exercise then has food as a reward. The <laughs> exercise is the reward. The fact that I can today, I did a, a bar class and I was jumping off the ground and probably looking like an absolute idiot with my sister-in-law, by the way, who does them with me, which is fantastic. Uh, we were both jumping off the ground looking like idiots. But a few weeks ago, we weren't jumping off the ground because, you know, that was too hard. So yeah. that's the reward. Getting to, be able least, to actually move you had, is fantastic. At least you had company, Fenella. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but that was good. Uh, my question to you is that, uh, yeah. Fenella, how often do you exercise? Is it every day or every day. five days a week? How, how do you so, make a so every day, and I try and do five, uh, I guess, high intensity workouts throughout the week. So of at least half an hour. Good. And then I normally have two days that I'm walking. So it's not as, not as high on the intensity, but I'm still active and keeping my body moving. Excellent. So, yeah. So that's what I do every week. Uh, and it feels really good. And I'll talk about it a little bit in some other bits, but I had a couple of weeks, not that long ago, where I fell into a bit of a, a rut. Um, and exercise is one of the things that when I came back to it, I realized that I was stupid forever stopping it because it just, I feel, feel better. So it also means that I'm setting some great goals for the future because I don't like to just plan for now. I like to plan, you know, for later. So things like next year, I've convinced my cousin to do a triathlon pink with me in January. So I was only going to be a short one. We are going to do all three things, which means, you know, I'm going to have to get swimming again soon once I can get back in the pool. 
Uh, and I, my husband wants to do what's called the Hop It, which is, which is a cross-country ski race. We're going to do the short one next year and then we'll work our way up. But that's still seven kilometres on the short one. And then oh, my big goal is to, in 2022, to do Tough Mudder because oh, wow. I have always looked at it and thought, I think I would enjoy that. And then I look at me and go, yeah, but I wouldn't make it through the first 500 metres. So I've already said 2022, I'm going to do Tough Mudder, which means oh. that... I've got to train, you know, and that's I'm not going to let myself down. That's right. Nice. You see, what it's you're doing right that. now, Fenella, what you're doing right now is you are making your commitment public. You yep. have to live up to it now. Yeah, that's absolutely. The of the courage that you have to make it public because now you are committed to that goal. Yeah. You can't chicken out. Nope. <laughs> because we'll be interviewing you again in 2022. Exactly. <laughs> just after I've done Daddy, tough mud. Yes, we want to see you. Is that where yeah. you get mud? Is that the mud? Thing? Yeah, you do the mud, the the zapping, the everything. It's absolutely brutal. But to me, yeah. the sense of accomplishment, if I could get through that, is worth. Good on you. Anything. Well, I know Danny has already made a note in her diary to contact you in 2022. <laughs> Yeah, good. You sure. I might join you. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> That's Absolutely. Even She's joining oh, look, you to make sure I'll, you I'll join. I'm raising a team. So if anybody's interested, you know, in 2022, just hey. hit me up. I know I've got a girlfriend that uh, she might be on tonight um, that's actually does that quite regularly and, uh, you know, puts it on Facebook. And I just think, wow, that's amazing. What an achievement. So yeah. good on you. And to well have done, those Vanilla. goals. Keep going. Yeah. Sorry, keep Rick, interrupting keep going, you. No, you're right. So my next one, which we've already, you guys have touched on a bit, is guided meditation. So um, I got into this through a, a wellness and occupational um, counsellor through my workplace because we started, I, I went to see her and we had that, that moment when I realised how, how bad this voice was. When she asked me to say something positive about myself and I almost started crying because I couldn't do it. I, I felt it so hard to say anything good about myself. And... Even now, I saw that battle of, you know, what is egotistical and what is just healthy self-recognition. Um, but I, she got me onto guided meditation, which is just to change this inner voice, to take control back of my inner voice. So part of what we, you know, repeat to ourselves and that she's taught me to repeat to myself is that I am enough. So although I want to make changes, I want to lose weight, there's nothing wrong with that. But I am, as, I am a person, I am right now, I am enough. Uh, and this repeating that, you know, I don't have to be better than I am right now is really, 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 really helpful for me because it means when that inner voice comes in that goes, you know, oh, you haven't, how much weight have you lost this week? Or, uh, you know, oh, that dress doesn't fit you yet. Or, you know, is that really what you're going to walk out looking like today? The other part of my voice now goes, no, no, you can go away. Thank you very much. I am enough. And I, I feel good about myself. And this is what I'm learning through guided meditation. So a lot of positive affirmation about, you know, myself and listening to this stuff and taking that time to go, you know, it's okay. And I'm, I'm actually starting to retrain that voice, which means that I'm able to catch the self-sabotage very, very quickly now. Yeah. You know, the previous patterns of, you know, feeling bad about myself, they don't last long because I catch it. I hear it and I go, no, 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 that's, that's not, that's not who I want to be anymore. It's not what my brain needs to think anymore. I, I deserve a, a brain that, and a, and a inner voice that's going to believe in me that, you know, knows I can succeed, not thinks I'm going to fail. Absolutely. So I've changed this narrative in my head and, you know, it's still a work in progress and I meet with her actually every couple of weeks and we still develop skills and we're still building stuff up because it's going to take time. I'm changing a voice that's been embedded in there for a very, very long time. It's not going to change overnight. But if I can make a little bit of progress every week to get, you know, stronger mentally, then it's just going to get better and better and better. Absolutely. And, and our mind is, is a muscle that needs to be exercised and, and, you know, talked to as well. And that awareness that you're talking about is critical. Yeah. Being aware that you are actually listening to that voice or not listening to it can make you make a, a decision that's going to benefit your health long term. Yeah. So that's been really good is to bring that awareness to the way that I'm mentally feeling and thinking about myself so that I can change that. 
that's really been a really, really important part for me because if I'm going to change myself physically, I need to mentally change with that or I'm going to end up where I was before. Yeah. It has to happen as a holistic approach. So next one is good food. And I guess I, oh, I've gone a bit too far. I, I'm a very fussy eater, so I've always <laughs> struggled with stuff and I've probably used that as a bit of an excuse in the past to not eat the right things. Um, but I, this now, I don't count calories. I haven't counted calories at all since my surgery. I have focused on the foods that I should be having to make myself feel good. So making sure that I eat protein to feel full, making sure that I get, you know, a mixture of fruit and veg with my meals throughout the day so that I'm getting those nutrients. But I don't, I don't count calories. I don't shy. I don't, I'm not terrified of a carb ending up on my plate. But if it's going to be on there, it's going to be a small portion of my meal. You know, I, I've been fairly careful with sugar because I know I'm addicted, I have a, you know, it's a very addictive substance. Mm. Um, so I've decided to myself that sugar is a, it's, you know, if I'm going to have it, it's going to be for a reason. It's not just going to be because it's there. Yeah. And it's actually making me feel very empowered about my food choices that, you know, at the end of a work day, because also I work in the same office as, as the, uh, the bakery teachers. So as you can probably imagine... <laughs> So the other day I went into work and the patisserie class had been making lemon meringue tarts and chocolate tarts. If that doesn't test you, nothing which, will. Which ones of work time oh, would it be? And I had a physical day at work too. I'd been on my feet all day. And in the past, I would have absolutely gone for it. And I looked at it and I thought, I'm going to feel physically ill, mm. literally, from eating that. Yeah. And I'm going to feel mentally really bad about myself. Because yeah. I'm going to go, why have I done that? That's not, it's not what I'm about. So I actually held my head up high, said, no, thanks, I'm good, and headed on about my day. Yeah, so yeah. the fact that I'm able to, you know, make that choice now rather than feeling like that choice is made for me is yeah. really empowering. And then and I came I think, home and I had a lovely dinner full of protein and veggies. So Beautiful. And I think yeah. also, Fenella, having had the surgery, there's only so much we can fit into our stomach at this yeah. stage. Yeah. Um, 12 months along, I can eat more. But, um, and so you just think to yourself, well, I want to make sure I can get in food that's actually good for me. Exactly. Um, you know, because otherwise I'm going to be not looking after my nutritional value and my health. Yeah. Um, and so you search for that. And I did exactly yeah. the same. I didn't count one calorie. I wasn't even concerned because yeah. I knew when I was full, I was full. Yeah. And yeah. The, the, my stomach would tell me. And I just made sure that I ate well. You know, yeah. And, and I think that's the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So my uh, fifth one is commitment. So my commitment is to myself. My commitment is to being the person that I want to be, not the person that I was. And this is really important. So when I had this struggle for a few weeks, I woke up one morning and I went, the commitment bit in my head went, what are you doing? You, you decided you were going to do this 100%. You were going to give this your all. You're wasting time. You're literally just sitting here wasting time by eating stuff you shouldn't and not exercising. And that's not, it's not, what, it's not what I deserve. I deserve better than that. So I woke up one morning. It's about two weeks I had this kind of break, we'll call it, where I, you know, and I must admit when I went back to good food again, I could really feel the difference. Mm. Uh, but I woke up and I thought, I, I said I was going to be committed to this. I made a commitment to myself. What am I doing? And I went, no, this, today I eat properly and I exercise properly. And I did it. And I felt so much better mentally and physically. Yeah. And it's this just this reminder of, you know, what is it? Like, why do we need excuses? If you have a genuine reason not to do something, like if I, you know, if you're injured and you can't exercise and it's a genuine reason, then okay, take a break from exercise. But if you're a little bit tired, have you, have you got the energy to get a 30 minute workout done? Probably. Mm. Yeah. So I've kind of taken this thing where these excuses are just, I don't have room for them because they're not helping me. I only want to do things that are going to help me be who I want to be. I'm committed to making me, me, the me I want to be at least. So, you know, setting goals for the future is part of that too, is my commitment to this journey. It's not, I'm doing this for 12 months and then I'll be an ideal weight and I'll go on my merry way. This is, this is my lifestyle changing. Yeah. This is my whole life changing. and I'm committed to that 100%. And that doesn't mean I won't have a day where I eat something I shouldn't, or I won't ever have a day where I don't exercise, but it means that 
overall, I'm, I'm always working towards where I want to be. Absolutely. And, you know, when I complete the goals I've got now, I'll set new ones. There's always something harder and tougher out there that I can find to do. That's never going to be a challenge. That's fantastic. No, and that's the amazing. last, my last one I have is sharing my story, which for me has been a big thing. So in the past, as I mentioned before, I've always been scared of sharing if I've been on a diet or anything like that because of this fear of failure. So when I decided I was going to do this surgery, I thought, oh, I'm going to set up an Instagram page. In fact, it's, it's really, I guess, in a way, is, is my version of journaling. It's, my, it's a visual journal, but I also write with all the posts I put up mm. and I share kind of my feel about where it is. So normally it's any day that something, you know, I feel like I, I, I don't want to keep to myself, I share it. Uh, and, and even sometimes things I do want to keep to myself, like I've had a tough two weeks, I still share it because it's, it's part of what's happening. So I set up this Instagram page. And originally, I made it so it was private. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'll only just invite people that, you know, I want to be able to see this because otherwise people are going to see a photo of me at 165 kilos and you can't hide from that. You know, I, I asked my husband to take it and I said, it's not going to look good, but we got to do this. We got to get this photo. And then I started posting on it and I thought, no, I'm not going to be scared of failing because I'm not going to fail because I'm giving this everything. I'm setting myself up for success. So I'm going to share it. So I made it a public Instagram and I invited anybody on Facebook and that includes Facebook friends I haven't seen since I was in high school and, you know, probably way close to what I weigh now. And I said, this is where I'm at. I weigh 165 kilos and I'm having weight loss surgery. And if you want to see what's going to happen to me over the coming months and, and years of my life, follow. Mm. And, you know, I got, I got a lot of support from my friends and family and people that I haven't seen in years. And it was actually really, 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 really good. So sharing my story has been a really, really important part of this for me. So they're my six pillars that I use. Now I've just got a couple more things. Go for it. It's the reminder that it's not all about the scales. So uh, things like the fact that I can layer my clothes now, the fact that I don't feel rubbish in my clothes. I went shopping at Kmart the other day and managed to buy stuff without trying it on, which was amazing. Uh, they're not allowed to trying anyways isn't it oh, no i'm not allowed to try stuff on so i just had to buy and i was like oh this is risky i never would have done this before i can tuck my shirt into my pants which was a, a really exciting moment for me that was the top left um but it's the fact that i i have this this life now i'm starting to get this life back that i, I feel like i'm in control of and i feel powerful in it so part of my kind of mantra that that i that i'm trying to embody is that I'm going to share my struggles and wins with the people in my life. I'm not going to let a fear of failure or judgment hold me back. So I'm not going to let the scary thought of someone judging me for having weight loss surgery hold me back. Who cares? Mm. I'm proud of my decision. I'm, I'm not going to be scared of failure because I'm setting myself up for success. Exactly. And I'm going to share my story. And that doesn't matter if it's the, the person who I work with, one of my best friends, or a friend's parent I see down at the supermarket who says, wow, you look great. What have you done? I say I had gastric sleeve surgery and I have worked really hard since then. So I'm not, I'm not going to let fear stop me. You just get yeah. congratulations there, Fenella. Um, oh, thank you. People. Um, oh yeah. And I was just going to say, and what's your Instagram page? If, so if you want to follow my Instagram, uh, yep. it is at project underscore Nell. Yep. Uh, and more than happy to have you. Uh, and I said, you'll get to see me as I keep going on my journey and, and sharing the stuff that I get up to, basically. Thank you so um, much. That's not a problem. Awesome. Thank you for coming Amazing. on tonight and discussing really, really that good, with really us. Really powerful stuff. And being brave enough to share that. And yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think um, having it out there, the same with myself, gives us, a, uh, you know, accountability, but strength as well. Um, and uh, I'm sure you will do tremendously well. And uh, we, we look forward to hearing how you progress later on. We might touch base with you in a few more months, maybe the 12 yeah. month mark or something to see yeah, good. where Absolutely. you're at. That's just in awesome. Fact, just on a, on, a, on a scientific note, the uh, d uh, data suggests that people who lose majority of their weight in the first three to six months have got a much better chance of long-term success. So the initial trajectory of your weight dropping is more acute. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
it's it, that's what you know allows you to kind of you know set up these circuits in the brain for the longer run so that's good on you well done perfect. Uh, we've gone over a little bit of time, but I think it was well worth it this evening. I hope that um, the, the participants um, got something out of it. Next week, just quickly touching on that, is a, a must watch. If you, if you care about your health, next week is about gut health. And um, Dr. Deer has got a wealth of knowledge in that area. And I'm actually, fingers crossed, he puts together a program just on gut health telling us week by week what we should be eating and drinking for ultimate gut health would be awesome. Because even though I've read the books, you know, it, there's a lot of information. And if it was clarified into small segments of, yep, this is what you got, you got to do to, you know, get your stomach prepared for the next level. And this is what you need to do to feed the, the gut, you know, for the right sort of, you know, outcome and so forth, that would be wonderful. So next week, that's the focus. Dr. D, did you want to say anything about that or? Yeah, no, I think uh, where it all came from for me was uh, that people would come and see me and they would often say, oh, I'm taking this exotic probiotic or this supplement. It's so fashionable these days to take probiotics, you know, so people are just popping in probiotics thinking that's the ideal solution to your gut health. And it's a misnomer because it's a myth. Uh, because simply taking a probiotic and not working on as Danny, you and Fenella, you have done, like you have literally made a shift in your diet because your gut bacteria, what they need is only one thing, which is plant-based fiber. That's the only thing that they need. And if you're not giving them that and you're giving them processed foods, well, there's no point taking probiotics. It's not going to do. And we'll go deep into the science behind it because once again, information leads to transformation. Absolutely. So thank you again for everybody for attending and for our co-hosts this evening. And hopefully you found some benefit in it. Please feel free to email us your questions or suggestions um, and make sure that for next week that you do actually click on the link for the, I think it's the 21st next week, uh, where we'll meet again and talk about gut health. And I think we would encourage all our panelists, uh, sorry, and uh, sorry, the attendees to share this webinar, uh, you know, invitations with your friends and family because I guess it's a free service but every week we are getting new people who have got a unique twist to their story and uh, there is so much opportunity to learn and share over here especially with as we are slowly emerging from self-isolation. Absolutely. All right. Thank you everybody. We'll sign off here. See ya. Thank Thanks, you. Vanilla. Bye -bye. Thanks, Vanilla. Bye. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See ya.